Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Craig Coopersmith, and I'm here to moderate what would hopefully be a spirited, lively, and enlightening discussion between doctors Mackey and Kumar. Uh, and we're going to have a pro-con debate on monotherapy versus combination antimicrobial therapy of sepsis and septic shock. We're going to have the unusual pro-con and that we're actually going to start with the con rather than the pro, although in this sense con is um, monotherapy. And with this, I'll introduce Dr. Dennis Mackey. The clarification of the conditions of the debate, uh, I interpret them as being resolved. Combination antimicrobial therapy, which I think most intensivists use for a patient who is septic, as contrasted with monotherapy, yields improved outcomes in patients with sepsis and septic shock. I'm going to strive to convince you that that is not necessarily true. Clarification of the conditions of the debate. I'd like to spend about five minutes because it's not quite as clear as just saying monotherapy or combination therapy. And there are five issues I'd like to address. First of all, I think that septic shock mandates an algorithmic approach to the patient that is every bit as complicated as managing cardiogenic shock, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, and a whole variety of complex problems that we deal with on a daily basis. And I think it's often more formidable than many of these issues. I cannot emphasize enough fundamentals, how important it is to strive to make a very intensive effort to try to identify the source of infection, which allows us to implement source control and to choose targeted antimicrobial therapy. That should be our goal, is targeted antimicrobial therapy guided by our suspicion of the probable source of infection and our knowledge of the likely pathogens at that source in our own institution. And we won't talk about supportive or adjunctive therapy, but that's a very essential part of the overall management of a patient who's septic. Establishing the diagnosis is not a trivial issue. And in my experience as an intensivist who's also interested in infectious disease and does a lot of infectious disease beyond critical care medicine, it's been my impression that critical care physicians don't always make as much of an effort to find the source of infection as they ought to. And I think it is indefensible to try to treat a patient for a suspected ventilator-associated pneumonia without trying to identify the infecting organism or reasonably determine the patient has a pneumonia by appropriate studies. In terms of gram stains, they're extremely useful. A gram stain of a deep tracheal aspirate has got quite good predictive value, and if it's negative, completely negative, you show no organisms, there's a high likelihood that this is not a typical gram-negative or staphylococcal pneumonia. Source control is also very important. It should never be underestimated. Now, getting it right the first time is absolutely essential when we're talking about the anti-infective management of the critically ill patient. One of the most elegant studies, I think, in the critical care literature was published about eight years ago by Marin Collis Group, where they did nothing more than prospectively look at the predictors for survival from a bacteremic infection in the medical and surgical ICUs at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. And what they found was quite astonishing, and that was one third of the patients got a regimen that was not effective in vitro against what cultured on the patient's bloodstream. And almost 70% of those patients died. There have been numerous studies since that time that have reaffirmed, if you get it wrong at the beginning, you have a greatly increased mortality. Now the problem that we're dealing with, and that bears heavily on empiric therapy, is life-threatening infection in the 21st century is in a large and growing proportion of cases sepsis caused by antibiotic-resistant bacteria or even yeast. If we don't acknowledge this in our decision making, again, our patients are not going to do well. We're all familiar with the rapid growth of MRSA, gram-negative resistance, fluoroquinolone, fluoroquinolone resistance with pseudomonas that's literally gone out of sight, uh, VRE, uh, penicillin-resistant pneumococcus, uh, which is a significant problem globally and bears on community-acquired pneumonia, which we'll be talking about shortly. Resistance with pneumococcus not only includes penicillin, but it can ex include extended spectrum beta-lactams and even fluoroquinolones. An emerging global pathogen that we're all dealing with in the ICU are patients who come in from the community who have sepsis, which is caused by community-acquired MRSA. 
Well, the prime directive for anti-infective therapy in critical illness with most intensivists uh, over the last 10 to 15 years has been start heavy and broad, end narrow and focused. 